Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. We begin today's program with news that's likely to affect some Vermont fruit growers, as well as those of us who love native raspberries, blueberries, and other soft-skinned fruits. A small fruit fly called the spotted wing drosophila, or SWD, is a threat to commercial plantings and home fruit gardens. Over the past decade, SWD has spread across the country west to east. It was first seen in Vermont in 2012. For this growing season, experts have some words of advice for growers and consumers. Here's UVM Extension's berry specialist, Vern Grubinger. Spotted wing drosophila, or SWD as it's known, um, has continued to persist in Vermont in uh, fruit crops especially late in the season, so it's fall raspberries, late season blueberries. Um, they'll get into some tomatoes if there's little cracks, but those are the really the biggest uh, problems that we have right now for commercial growers. And they, it has popped up every year pretty reliably, slightly different times, but if you're growing those crops, it's a pest that you have to be ready to deal with. Commercial growers, homeowners, uh, any scale really of production can be affected. Uh, when people aren't ready for it, they can take a serious uh, economic hit in the case of farmers or backyard growers can just lose all their crop. So it's really important to be aware that this isn't a pest that you necessarily see very easily because it's a tiny little fruit fly, um, but you'll see the fruit when it's affected because it starts to rot. On a small scale for backyard growers or even commercial growers that don't have lots of acreage, uh, insect netting has proved to be very effective. So there's specialized netting that has the right size openings that uh, is on the market for SWD. And you put that over some kind of a trellis to keep it above the crop. And if you take care of it, it'll last for many years. And um, it's a really, really good tool to control this pest um, on a scale you know, that's affordable. When you get into multiple acres, the netting gets to be pretty expensive. SWD traps aren't for controlling the pest, it, it, they are for monitoring for when it arrives. Um, and it used to be people were making homemade traps with red solo cups and all kinds of mixtures of yeast and cider and things like that. And now it's much simpler, there's some great commercial traps on the market, very uh, inexpensive, and those are formulated to have a really good lure and to be visually attractive to the pest, so that's what most growers are going with. There are a number of cultural practices that are really important to controlling this pest. One is timely harvest. As soon as any fruit becomes ripe, to pick it as soon as you can rather than leave it out there where it's vulnerable to attack. Uh, picking up dropped fruit that also provides a site for the insect to reproduce is a good practice. And one thing that's really important and pretty simple is to refrigerate any picked fruit right away because there may be a very tiny uh, SWD egg in there that you can't see and certainly poses no harm to people to eat. But um, under cold temperatures, it won't develop. Um, in room temperature, uh, what happens is they hatch and the larvae cause the fruit to rot. One important fact to note is when fruit are not ripe, SWD are not attracted to them. So there's no need to monitor before fruit's ripening or to put netting up. So essentially, as soon as anything is about to ripen, that's the time to be prepared, to put up traps, to put up netting, um, and also if people are spraying, anything to control the insects, to be ready to do that. This year they're starting to catch small numbers of SWD a little earlier than in the past, so it, it may be a, a more difficult season for them, we're not sure yet. So when there's only one or two in the traps, people aren't that alarmed. Um, it's really when you start to get into the dozens and hundreds, and that typically starts to happen um, toward the end of August. As Vern pointed out, the key to beating the spotted winged Drosophila is to harvest fruit as soon as it ripens and chill or freeze it immediately. Although it may sound rather gross, there is no harm to human health from eating fruit containing SWD larvae. Our next segment takes us to a beef farm in the Northeast Kingdom. Shat Acres Farm in Greensboro Bend raises Highland cattle, which is one of the oldest breeds in the world and is known to produce some of the best tasting meat. Here's Across the Fences, Keith Silva. Highlands are thought to be one of the oldest cattle breeds in the world. Raised for centuries on the cold coasts and rugged highlands of Scotland, these animals are resilient and robust. Between their horns and distinctive long hair, nothing else looks like a highland because nothing else is a highland. I get along with animals probably better than I do people. And I guess if I can get along with these highland cattle, I guess that's enough. Nearly 50 years ago, Ray Shatney's father thought the pedigree, uniqueness, and vigor of Highlands 
would be a good fit for his family's Rocky Hill Farm in Greensboro Bend. My dad, back in the late uh, mid-60s, decided that he wanted something different besides just dairy cows, and he had a friend who had a Highland cow. He sort of inherited the Highland cow for $50, which was, I guess was more than what she was worth back then, but he loved the Highlands and he built a Highland herd. This farm wouldn't be worth much for anything else. It's definitely not an area for dairy farming. These uh, hillside farms in Vermont don't do well in dairying and uh, it's great for the Highlands. It's wooded and there's a lot of stone here. Uh, I think my dad purchased these places so we'd have something to do Sunday afternoon was picking stone. And we still haven't got them all picked. They keep, a new shipment comes in every year. Along with being hardy, Highlands are also gentle and known as easy keepers. To show how laid back his Highlands are, Shatney likes to hone his hairstyling techniques. And the cows like it too. As for those horns, well, Shatney makes sure to keep his distance when mom is around. The only time we have to worry that I worry about the horns, and I have the same problem with an animal without a horns, they're good mothers and they will protect the newborn calf. So we're real careful around the newborns. You'll see the calves out behind me here. Almost everyone has a tag in it. The young ones that don't have a tag, mom said I couldn't give it a tag. Between this farm in Greensboro Bend and another in Plainfield, the entire herd numbers 170. About two thirds are purebred Highlands and the rest are Highland Crosses. For Shatney and his wife, Janet Stewart, it's the right size herd and the perfect fit for their family. One of the things we're trying to do is produce a model that other farmers and other people who want to farm can do. They are not a commercial breed. They are very slow growing. It is very hard to um, make them economically viable, which is why very few people raise them, and which is why most people who have Highland cattle stay with the breed five years. And so what we want to do is show people how you can be successful, because we want the Highland breed to continue. Because Highlands don't grow as fast as more commercial breeds, like Angus or Hereford, Shatney crossbreeds his highlands with shorthorns. This keeps the farm financially viable by being able to have more meat ready for market more often while also maintaining the highland genetics. The highland cattle in Scotland would probably be just about extinct today if it wasn't for crossbreeding. So they discovered many years ago that the highland cattle will not survive just uh, being Highland cattle. The Highlands history classifies them as a heritage breed. These breeds are popular with small-scale farmers who want to raise their own meat or develop a value-added product. Heritage is, is a lifestyle preservation. It's, it's Joe Emenheiser is University of Vermont Extension's livestock specialist. One of the most important or valuable tools in, in production agriculture and viability from an animal genetics or breeding standpoint is crossbreeding. And, and the power that, that's gained from crossing two breeds together uh, is really huge. And, and the trick is that that crossbreeding requires that the breeds be preserved and be able to be put together. And getting crossbred calves that grow considerably more efficiently, uh, have higher meat yield and so on and so forth, but they're still doing everything that they want to preserve the highland breed and to enjoy them for the reasons that they have them. As majestic as these animals are with their long hair and long horns, their place on this farm has one purpose. Shatney sends at least one animal a week off for processing. Because the highlands are pasture raised and slow to grow, their meat is tender with low levels of cholesterol and high in omega-3 fatty acids. Their hair acts as insulation, so highlands store fat in the meat, and fat is where the flavor is at. A lot of the key to our being able to um, get people familiar with the highland beef is you get it in their mouth. And once it's in their mouth, that's what they want, because uh, as people 
tell us they've never tasted anything like it. If you look, anything fresh is a dollar off per pound. I have one fresh... Stewart believes this one-on-one, -on -one, tasting is believing, marketing approach gives their business a unique niche in the marketplace. I've been to a lot of conferences where people say, we've got to get into the Boston markets, we've got to get into the New York markets. That's not our goal. We want to produce healthy food for Vermonters. And we want to produce it in a way that they can come see where their food is raised, that they can come be with the animals, they can understand that this is how cattle are supposed to be raised. And right now, I don't want to have a lot of new markets. So you might say to me, how come you're not doing much more at promoting your beef? I can't raise any more beef than we're selling. This farm and these animals have a strong pull on this family. Chatney's grandson, Philip, has started to help out. He's the next generation to develop a love for these animals and this lifestyle, something Ray understands well. What have I learned in 50 years dealing with Highlands? Probably learned some stuff about myself that they like being out here and I sort of like being out here too. And no matter what else happens when I was working, uh, you could always come back to the farm and but you just sat and watched them. They're awful good therapy. They feed you more ways than one. Highland cattle, good for the body, better for the soul. In the highlands of Greensboro Bend, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Our congratulations to Ray and Janet at Shat Acres Farm for their award-winning beef. And once again, thank you for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Thank you.